What would the formation of the solar system look like if we took into consideration the electromagnetic force? Let's explore Hannes Alvin's theory for the formation of the solar system. The current theories on the formation of the solar system are dominated by two theories, Laplace's theory and the tidal theory. The Laplacian theory cannot explain why the main part of the angular momentum in the solar system is possessed by the outer planets and not by the Sun. In this theory, the viscosity of the gas is too small to transfer the considerable momentum from the Sun to the outer planets. In the tidal model, the collision of two stars is very improbable, let alone that the result of this impact would not create anything resembling our solar system. In order to explain this, there has to be another force which was acting, which was not accounted for in any of these theories. And they employ gravity and other mechanical forces, but they do not include the electromagnetic force. If we assume that our solar system was formed from a gas cloud, as we have previously seen, it is highly likely that this gas can ionize to some degree and therefore the electromagnetic force must be included in the formation process. If we take a proton and place it at the same relative orbit as the Earth, moving at the same orbital velocity, we find that the force exerted by the magnetic field of the Sun on the proton is 60,000 times larger than the gravitational one. Even if we move it out to the orbit of Pluto and match Pluto's orbital velocity the magnetic field is still 250 times stronger than the gravitational one. If ionized matter is brought into the vicinity of the Sun, then the magnetic field will cause this plasma cloud to experience a force in the same direction as the rotation of the Sun. This is caused by the polarization of the magnetic field of the Sun. As this plasma moves through the magnetic field, a system of currents will then be produced which will oppose this motion. The time required for the Sun to impart a great deal of its angular momentum through this process into a plasma cloud surrounding it may be as short as only a hundred thousand years. And it would also be expected that this retardation of the solar rotation would be greatest at the highest heliographic latitudes. Now could this explain why the solar rotation is slower at the poles than at the equator? So how easily could an electric approach explain the formation of the solar system? First, we must examine how the charged particles would behave on approach to the Sun's environment. The motion of the charged particles depends upon their energy. The total energy is a combination of the magnetic energy imparted on them and the gravitational energy. And in particular, we are interested in the condition when these two values are of equal strength. For lighter particles, this will happen much further out. Both the electrons and the protons will feel this effect far out beyond the orbit of Pluto. Whereas an oxygen ion would be at about the radius of Saturn. These particles have a number of forces that will act upon them, causing them to move only along the surface of the rotating magnetic field lines of the Sun, sort of like a sphere. Now let's assume that a gas cloud enters the solar system, and it's composed of neutral and ionized atoms, having initially very low velocities. Now gravity will cause the cloud to start to move towards the Sun, and at the same time, the magnetic field will affect all the ionized material as well. It should be obvious that this ionized material cannot approach the Sun to any great degree, as they are forced to move along the surface of these magnetic field lines, creating a sort of shield around the Sun. The neutral material, on the other hand, will fall towards the Sun under the action of gravity. If the cloud contains a large number of atoms, then as their velocity increases, more and more random collisions will take place, and this will cause the gas to start to heat up. At a certain point, the temperature will be sufficient to ionize it, and the exact point at which this occurs can be calculated, although it must be realized that the gas will be partly ionized earlier than this point. 
and this will again mean that once the gas becomes ionized, it will again be trapped by the sun's magnetic field, stopping the inward motion. And if the material then condenses into planets, we would expect to find the most dense planets at this location. And in our solar system, the most dense planets are Jupiter and then Saturn. Now this gas cloud is likely to be composed of a variety of atoms, and let's suppose it consists of hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sodium, magnesium, silicon. Their ionization potentials are as follows. So for hydrogen, it's 13.5 electron volts. For helium, 24.5. For carbon, it's 11.2. For oxygen, it's 13.1. For nitrogen, it's 14.5. Sodium, 5.1. Magnesium, 7.6. And silicon, 8.1. Now if we average the ionization energies and the atomic mass for this cloud and we calculate the point at which those two energies, the gravitational and the magnetic, are equal, then we find that for our solar system that this material would halt at around the orbit of Jupiter. Assuming the gas cloud falls in towards the Sun in equal numbers from all directions, then we will end up with a gas cloud of even density distributed across the surface of a sphere at about the location of Jupiter. And at this point, they are ionized and can only move along the magnetic field lines. And as the rotation of the magnetic field imparts momentum, the cloud will begin to rotate in the same direction as this rotating magnetic field. And this will cause the ionized material to move towards the equatorial plane along the magnetic field lines. And this will create the following density distribution from this point. So, as we see in the diagram, the material would collect at that ionization limit, so the line that you see there, and then the material would be pushed out through the magnetic field lines, creating a distribution as you see in the diagram. So the smallest amount would be distributed furthest out and the largest distribution would remain close to that ionization limit. Now Alvin goes on to calculate the, the density distribution based on the following magnetic field line, so in the diagram that you see, and he finds that this model matches closely with the observed density of the outer planets. And, and just to stress, this is not a diagram that he's simply drawing. There are a lot of equations um, and calculations that he does. So if you're interested in that, please read the, the three papers that will be uh, linked in the description. That will give you a lot more information on how he gets to that step, but it, it's too detailed to go into it in this particular video. So when he finishes those calculations, then he finds that the model matches closely with the observed densities of the outer planets. So how do the planets then form their own moons, their own satellites? Assuming that after the formation of the planet, a small fraction of the gas cloud remains, and that this gas has now been neutralized, and we will talk more about the process of that condensation in a bit. But let's assume that the gas has remained after the planet has formed and it's neutral. This gas will then start to fall in towards the planet under the action of gravity. And again, as it starts to fall inwards, random collisions would cause the temperature to rise, which would cause the gas to start to become ionized. Now, the magnetic field of the planet would halt the inward fall of this ionized gas in exactly the same way as before. And Alvin uses the same equation as before, but using the mass of the planet now instead of the mass of the sun to calculate the point at which the ionization occurs from the planet. The larger the mass of the planet, the further out this will happen. And this will affect where satellite formation takes place. Uh, and this caused the creation of the inner satellites for both Jupiter and Saturn, including its rings. And we will talk more about the ring formation in a little bit. And this is also why there are no inner satellites for Neptune and Uranus. Their mass is too low and this material would simply have impacted on the surface of the planet before being ionized. So why does Saturn have a ring system and not Jupiter? Saturn has a mass that means that ionization of the material is close enough to the planet 
compared to Jupiter, meaning that the gravitational field is strong enough to prevent the coalescence of larger bodies at that point. And this is what is known as the Roche limit. And in the case of Jupiter, the ionization point is above this Roche limit. So the point at which the ionization occurs, Jupiter's gravity will not affect the coalescence of those objects into larger objects. Now Jupiter does have its own rings that are barely visible, but these would not have formed during the same process and probably were captured dusts which ends up within this Roche limit around Jupiter, having been attracted over a very gradual and long time rather than a sudden big dust cloud creating the satellites. Now the inner solar system and the outer uh, satellites of Saturn and Uranus cannot have formed at the same time as the original families was created because another process needs to be taken into consideration to form these. Now the inner planets cannot have formed via the same process because we know that the, the gas would be stopped at the point of Jupiter. So how do we form the inner planets? Now an incoming gas would not pass past the orbit of Jupiter unless it had a lower ratio of the mass to the ionization energy. And even if the atomic mass was as low as hydrogen, it couldn't pass beyond the orbit of Venus. But the density of these bodies would be much lower than we actually observe if that were the case. So is it possible that the inner planets were formed from a gas expelled by the Sun? But equally, this still faces the same problem as outlined previously, that this matter would end up being pushed outwards. It is therefore highly unlikely that they were formed in either of these two ways. So therefore, is it possible that the inner planets were formed from a meteoric dust cloud instead? As there are many similarities between the inner and outer planets, the axial rotation, the orbits, the relative spacing, it means that we need to consider that they were formed in a similar way. And if this meteoric dust cloud reached the area of the inner solar system, it would, through a similar process as the gas, become heated, eventually becoming volatized, and this gas could then uh, become ionized, a process similar to the outer planets could then lead to the formation of the inner planets. As this material formed from meteoric dust, it would account for the higher density of the inner planets compared to the outer planets. Parts of this ionized material would be expelled along the magnetic field lines of force. Some fraction of this material will reach the outer planets. And while it is ionized, it cannot approach the outer planets. And over time, this ionized material will reconstitute back into a neutral atom. And once this happens, the force of gravity will attract it to these large outer planets. And through the process that we've already discussed, it could then form the outer satellites of the other planets. Hannes goes on to discuss how this recombination and condensation process might work. While the gas is ionized, it is under the effect of the gravitational, the magnetic and the electric force acting on it. And once a neutral atom is formed, it is no longer under this force and only gravity is causing it to now follow an elliptical path according to Kepler's law. He shows that these particles will have an eccentricity of a third so quite a, 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 an elliptical orbit. And if this recombination takes place in the equatorial plane, these neutral particles will collide with each other and this will smooth out their eccentricity over time, transforming the ellipse into more circular orbits, but having the same angular momentum as the ellipse, but a radius which would be two-thirds the radius of the original ionized ring. He points out that this is a very important law and it means that any matter from an existing planet came from a distance equal to 1.5 of its present distance. And he shows that this would explain why there are gaps in the Saturnian ring system. He shows that the matter 
would recombine and condense from the outside inwards. Now Mimas lies close to the Roche limit and as Mimas formed the recombination material 1.5 times further out would move inwards where the material was still ionized and it would have swept away the remaining material which later as it recombined would move inwards leaving an empty space where Mimas removed the material. The same would happen with the ring material itself, again forming from the outside inwards, and we would expect to find the shadow of the ring itself beginning at two-thirds the distance of the outer edge. And in a later paper, we may cover this, he goes into a lot more detail on the formation of the Saturnian system. When turning to asteroids within the solar system, uh, where we find the asteroids between Jupiter and Mars, again, if we look at the edge of the asteroid belt and assume that some of this material may have coalesced and moved inwards, its current position would end up being exactly where we find Mars. Looking at both the asteroid belt and the Saturnian rings, they provide valuable clues to the coalescence process. Something prevented the formation of this dust into larger objects. And in the case of Saturn's rings, it's obvious that this was caused by the proximity to Saturn itself, the Roche limit. Explaining the asteroid belt is somewhat harder. Hannes Alvin goes on to analyze the density function compared to the radius and the adjacent planets. So this graph is drawn in pairs of planets and he draws the following graph and from this graph two different lines become evident uh, strongly supporting the idea that the solar system was indeed formed in two separate waves. What is interesting from this graph is if we look at the Earth-Mars pairing because it doesn't fit on either of those two graphs and this means that the mass of one of these is probably wrong assuming that these must have been created in the second wave of formation. And what is more remarkable is that if we replace the Earth with the Moon, so a Moon-Mars uh, combination, this falls back onto the second curve. Now the Moon's larger mass and its larger distance from Earth make the Moon no ordinary satellite. The density of the Moon is almost the same as the density of Mars. Now, interestingly, Hannes goes on to actually discuss the, the problem with Mars and the Moon. The fact that they are related to each other implies that they were formed through the same process, and the fact that their densities do not match the inner planets and do not match the outer planets, he goes on to speculate the following. So he sees it that, first of all, a, a meteoric dust cloud formed Mars and the Moon together. They were some of the first satellites to form and they probably formed closer to the Sun than they are today. Then shortly after or just as that was happening the gas cloud arrives forming what he terms as the first family. So the large outer planets Saturn and Jupiter and then shortly after that a second invasion of another meteoric dust cloud forms the inner planets and then the outer satellites of the outer planets. Now, Hannes goes on to look at the asteroid belt in more detail, and although he can come to no firm conclusion as to why exactly the asteroid belt did not coalesce into a planet, he reasons as part of the answer might lie in the fact that if we look at Jupiter, uh, then if material ionized at the point of Jupiter and then coalesced, then as it moved inward to its two-third distance, it would be at the beginning edge of where the asteroids would form. And equally as we've discussed, material which then later came in in a second episode, which was at that point of the asteroids, would move in towards uh, Mars. Now, it could be that these asteroids never coalesce because of the resonance with Jupiter. So Jupiter's gravity was strong enough to disturb some of these asteroids into forming uh, into larger bodies. But there is no firm answer in, in what he gives. So where 
does this leave us? Because obviously this theory is not an accepted theory for the formation of the solar system. For me, what is important to take away from this is the idea of how ionized material behaves around planets and stars with magnetic fields. And just understanding that effect alone, I think, is a huge step forward to us seeing how this electric universe might function. Also realizing that matter which is not ionized can easily become ionized and then the same principles take place. I think there's great merit in his theory of how uh, planetary formation could be accounted for through this process, whether it is from an ion cloud or a dust cloud, the analogies to how that process works are very, very interesting. And again, we do see clues of this within our solar system. We know that um, around the orbit of Earth and Venus and Mercury, all ar around those orbits, there are still very small um, dust clouds and meteors, very small ones, which orbit in the same path as we do. Now, is that evidence potentially of remnants left over from this creation process not being swept up because they had the same angular momentum and effect on moving with us through uh, the rotation? Could this also explain the Oort cloud that we see as a sphere around the sun? Could the formation be because this is ionized material? So as ionized material approaches the sun, it simply gets pushed out to this point. So is all of that then coalescing to form these uh, icy, rocky bodies? I don't know. It's another interesting analogy that we pulled together. For me, the other thing that was really interesting in this paper is the Mars-Moon connection. The fact that their densities are so closely matched and that he thinks that there is a connection between those two. I mean, if you look at the current theory for the form formation of the Moon, it's absolutely ludicrous. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So could it be that the moon was later captured by the Earth because it was formed in the same process as, as uh, Mars was? Who knows? I, I find it fascinating to think about this. And remember that we're talking Hannes Alvin here. He's not just some crackpot coming up with ideas. He's a Nobel laureate. He came up with a lot of these ideas around plasma. Um, so again i think it's important for us to go back to basics to understand the principles behind some of these things we often get caught up in this notion of that everything must be electric and everything must be connected together and it is so because you know someone else says it understanding where some of these people like hannes alvin come up with these ideas and fitting together the the beginning principle of it for me is part of that journey it's understanding how they think, how they came up with these ideas and what their basic principles are. Because these ideas that apply to ionized material around you know, rotating magnetic fields is what we see all across the universe. And if the universe is filled with 99% plasma and these magnetic fields play such an important role, then this is what we would expect to see. And just thinking you know, out loud, the picture that we see of this black hole with the, 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 the um, the accretion disk, this torus shape, is that what we would see in this in this event? Admittedly, there obviously would be a star at the centre, but as this disk starts to form, and as the magnetic field drives the material towards the equatorial plane, you would expect to see a, a torus shaped uh, debris ring around the star as planets start to form. Again, there are a lot of these connections that I'm starting to see and starting to make. I hope you've enjoyed this. Again, if you want to read more, the links are down below. It is quite heavy going, but it is definitely worth a read. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.